Thank you. So I have nothing to disclose. Here I'm presenting work that has been conducted as a collaboration between NIH and Maastricht, where those people here did most of the work. So we are interest, interested in high resolution and brain activity mapping across cortical layers, which is super challenging because it requires two important quality features. On one hand, we need a high sensitivity to deal with the small signal at tiny voxels. On the other hand, we also need high specificity without large training veins, for example. And either one is not enough, really. If you only have high sensitivity without layer specificity, you end up with fuzzy blobs. And on the other hand, all the specificity in the world is useless if your noise level is too high to see anything at all. So we uh, try to approach the sensitivity requirement by using ultra-high field strength, as nicely pointed out from the previous speaker as well. And we try to approach the um, specificity requirement with this non-invasive blood volume sensitive vasocontrast. So the purpose of this collaboration is to combine both and investigate the applicability of both together, high resolution layer dependent blood volume fMRI at 9.4 Tesla in humans. And the experimental setup available in Maastricht where those data were acquired is um, very similar to the ones from Valentin, namely this 9.4 Tesla Siemens scanner managed by Scanaxis, equipped with this AC84 head gradient, which is really highly rewarding for high-resolution EPI. For the RF, from the RF side, we're using the 60-channel transmit and 31-channel receive coil built from Zhajan. And we use this SSSI high-field optimized vasosequence, sequence, which is basically an inversion recovery sequence where we acquire two images along this relaxation curve. A first image is acquired when this red blood magnetization here crosses zero, the vaso image, and the second image is acquired without T1 preparation. So we have both bold and vaso every roughly about 1.5 seconds. The 0.75 millimeter readout is adjusted to be perpendicular to the motor cortex in this very small field of view here, while the inversion volume is desired to be played out in a more global fashion. And to modulate brain activity changes, we use this 12 minute finger tapping task. In order to get VASO going at 9.4 Tesla in humans, there are a whole lot of challenges that we first needed to identify and, and then account for. And I listed them here on the left, and I would like to go through them now one by one. The first obvious challenge of these ultra high field strength is are the, the SAR constraints. So we tried very, very hard to reduce the RF power of all the pulses involved. The RF power of the readout modules could be significantly reduced by refraining from these multiple 90 degree pulses of these 2D slice by slice um, um, 2D EPI readouts, but instead we uh, use Benedict Poser's 3D EPI readout, which excites the whole brain slab over and over again with lower flip angles. And in order to account for T1 relaxation history effects and, and related blurring across segments, we use this um, segment-specific variable flip angle, resulting in a very sharp point spread function. We tried to reduce the RF power of the inversion pulse by further optimizing this TR foci pulse. So we used the model introduced by Hurley and pushed it a bit further towards 9.4 Tesla by um, pushing the shape in a more, uh, the shape of the magnitude of the RF in this box shape kind of fashion. And we also relaxed the my parameter a bit, effectively lowering the bandwidth for higher SAR efficiency and even higher adiabaticity. So basically we are simply re-evaluating the different B0 and B1 constraints. And in our setup we are much more limited by B1, so we are pushing much more towards insensitivity to B1 inhomogeneities, because we're just not as desperately limited by B0 within a reasonable off-resonance regime. As you might know, 9.4 Tesla comes along with a lot of B1 plus inhomogeneities, like these destructive interference patterns. And in our motor cortex vaso setup, we are actually interested in two regions of interest where we want to have our optimized PTX shim. For imaging and readout, we want to have a high efficiency and homogeneity in the motor cortex. But for inversion, however, we also want to have a high efficiency across the brain for efficient spin labeling and, and inversion. And to achieve this, we could really benefit a lot from Desmond's very nice um, PTX shimming and mapping tools. And we actually did end up using two different optimized PTX volumes. For inversion, we use a global optimized shim, but for the readout, we actually use a local optimized shim for the motor cortex. So we're basically flipping back and forth between different shim modes within every TR. We believe that uh, with this kind of setup, we have uh, good inversion efficiency about roughly down to the circle of Willis. 
only leaving the question now, what happens with the blood below that? What happens with the blood that is below this good inversion at the time of inversion, but that flows in into the imaging region before the image is acquired? This blood might introduce some artifacts, as I want to explain here in this zoom section. You can see that this red inversion recovery blood magnetization takes about 1.5 seconds until it's nulled before the vaso image can be acquired. With this kind of inversion volume available, however, we believe that it only takes about one second until fresh blood already flows in. And in fact, we can already see these kind of inflow effects at seven Tesla sometimes. And here for the same person at 9.4 Tesla, we see that these inflow effects are much, much more. To minimize these kind of inflow effects and keep them out of the parenchyma, we use this trick that we reduce the negative blood magnetization after the inversion, which effectively reduces the inversion time further and further until the blood nulling time is shorter than the arterial arrival time. And we could achieve this um, um, adjustable inversion efficiency in a B1 independent way with a further adaptation of this adiabatic inversion pulse. Namely, we introduce this phase skip right at the time when we are on resonant along the adiabatic frequency sweep. A further optimization that we tried is that we refrain from conventional sum of squares coil combination methods, but in fact we use our own stability weighted um, coil combination method called Stark that is explained tomorrow in more details in the context for lower field strength, but um, we saw that it's also highly beneficial at 9.4 Tesla. For example, here you see the 31 individual channels, and even though the combined sum of squares magnitude image looks suspiciously okay, we have this uncoupling of image SNR and TSNR within the individual coil specific space. For example, here you can see that the nicest looking channel, that one over here that is the least grainy, is actually the worst in terms of temporal stability. And we have this um, signal void right on top of the motor cortex. Now combining these channels based on their stability, we can regain most of the TSNR on, top, on the motor cortex. So for most accurate signal analysis across cortical layers and depths, we use the inherent T1 contrast of our functional data for a good definition of the cortical surface. And we use the functional um, EPI face maps for a good definition of gray matter, white matter border. And with both of those surfaces, we can then grow our equivolume layers within EPI space, which helps a lot for the analysis of the blood volume and bold signal changes as a function of cortical depth where you might be able to see these kind of um, striping patterns here indicated as two different peaks. And it becomes a bit clearer when you do a bit of smoothing within cortical layers as um, shown also tomorrow from Platsejewska. Um, these kind of striping patterns are also reproducible in test retest experiments here, for example, um, in one subject across different days or also across different participants and many, many sessions where we always tend to see these double striping features in the more anterior part of the hand knob. So in conclusion, to do layer dependent blood volume fMRI in humans at 9.4 Tesla is challenging. But those people here from Maastricht, Ben Dimo Ivanov, Ben Posa, and Desmond said they could really make it happen. And based on their work, we could end up with these nice striping patterns. Thank you for your attention.